Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar in the CERDAP and ESCCP webinar series. My name is Rula Deeb. I'm a senior principal at Geosyntac Consultants in Oakland, California, and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of CERDAP and ESCCP. The webinar will consist of a brief overview of CERDAP and ESCCP followed by the technical portion, which details results from Department of Defense funded research on how annual cycles and genetic diversity constrain or enable responses to climate change. First, Dr. Julie Heath from Boise State University will discuss how research partnerships enhance phenology research. Her presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. Then Mr. Jason Winiarski, uh, also from Boise State University, will discuss a full annual cycle framework for forecasting species responses to climate change. His presentation will also be followed by a Q&A session, and we will conclude the webinar with a longer Q&A with both of our speakers. On this slide, we have provided a few suggestions in case you experience uh, difficulties with the broadcast audio. Firefox, IE, or Edge are the most compatible browsers to use. If you lose the content on your screen or if your screen freezes, try keying Control and F5 to perform a hard refresh. If you are accessing the audio through your computer, click the arrow next to the Join Audio button, select Test Speaker and Microphone, and follow the prompts as they appear on your screen. If you continue to experience difficulties, please call into the conference line shown here. You may also submit a comment using the chat box. Please use that chat box only for comments related to technical difficulties because the Q&A option should be reserved for questions for our speakers. Uh, today's broadcast will be listen only. Uh, you may submit questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A option to submit your questions. In fact, we do encourage you to submit questions well in advance of the Q&A sessions. When you do submit your questions, please make sure to add your organization and name at the end of your questions so that we can identify you. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Kurt Preston who is the CERDAP and ESCCP Program Manager for Resource Conservation and Resiliency. Dr. Preston has tracked his career between civilian, university, and military uh, positions. Prior to joining uh, CERDAP and ESCCP, he was a faculty member and research administrator at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where he led faculty development efforts to improve research competitiveness. In his position, he also worked with technology transfer uh, personnel, academic departments, and colleges to build university research capability. In addition, Dr. Preston has served as a member of Chief of the Army Corps of Engineers Environmental Advisory Board. Third. Well, I thank you, Rula. I'm happy to welcome everyone to today's CERTIP and ESTCP webinar. CERTIP is the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program established in 1991 by Congress as a partnership between the Department of Defense, the Department of Energy, and the Environmental Protection Agency. CERTIP's mission is to identify and address high priority environmental science and technology opportunities that focus on the DOD requirements. CERTIP funds both fundamental research as well as advanced technology development that ultimately impacts real-world environmental management. 
The ESTCP, ESTCP is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program in which we demonstrate innovative environmental and energy technologies. These investments capitalize on past investments under CERTIP and other research programs and are designed to transition technologies out of the laboratory and into the field. Especially important in all ESTCP demonstrations is the ultimate transition to implementation and regulatory acceptance. CERTIP and ESTCP are complementary programs, with much of CERTIP research occurring at the lab and pilot scale with occasional field efforts, while ESTCP demonstrations are primarily at the pilot and field scale although occasionally supporting lab efforts are conducted. There are four program areas in CERTIP and five in ESTCP. The installation energy and water program area is only in ESTCP, while the other four, environmental restoration, munitions response, resource conservation resiliency, and weapon systems and platforms are CERTIP and ESTC programs managed jointly by a designated program manager. Our webinar today is focusing on research and demonstrations that were conducted under the Resource Conservation and Resiliency Program area, which has essentially three main areas of research, natural resources, resiliency, and wildland fire. Our webinar series highlights research and demonstration efforts from each of the five program areas. As you can see, upcoming webinars will cover a broad range of topics, including manage, managing aqueous film forming foam impacts to subsurface environments, high resolution site characterization and mass flux reduction in groundwater, and sustainable coding systems for military platforms. You can find additional information about upcoming webinars at this link. Registration is now live for webinars through the end of the year. I would like to remind you that a copy of the, of the presentation of today's session can be downloaded from our webinar webpage. We would appreciate it if you can please take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen at the end of this webcast. I'm also pleased to announce that the CERTIP ESTCP Symposium will be held again this upcoming December in Washington, D.C. The three-day event will showcase the latest technologies that enhance DOD's mission through improved environmental and energy performance. Registration information is available on the CERTIP and ESTCP website. Finally, I hope you enjoy today's webinar. Great. Thank you so much, Kurt. And it is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, Dr. Julie Heath, who is a professor of biological sciences at Boise State University in Idaho. Uh, Julie's research focuses on avian responses to human-driven environmental change, such as climate change and human disturbance. She studies the mechanisms underlying animal and environment interactions at different scales, from individual behavior and physiology to population patterns and processes. Julie is the PI or principal investigator on a sort of supported effort titled, uh, full, cycle, titled uh, full Cycle Phenology. And this project uses an annual cycle framework to discuss the phenology of migratory birds and forecast population vulnerability to seasonal changes driven by climate change. And she'll be talking to you about this today. Uh, Julie earned her bachelor's degree in zoology from the University of California at Davis, a master's degree in raptor biology from Boise State University, and a doctoral degree in wildlife ecology and conservation from the University of Florida. Julie, please proceed. 
All right, great. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thanks to Kurt Rula and the rest of the CERTIP community for supporting our research in this presentation. And thanks to you attendees for listening. Uh, today, Jay Winiarski and I will present two components on our CERTIP supported research project that aims to address how annual cycles and genetic diversity affect responses of migratory birds to climate driven changes in seasonal timing. Specifically, I'm going to highlight how our network of partners facilitates large scale research across several disciplines from genetics to behavioral and population ecology, providing the foundation to conduct multifaceted comparative research across North America. This presentation will cover the following agenda items. First, I will describe how our, pro our project's research design led us to conclude that we needed to develop a partnership network. Next, I will talk specifically about how each phase of research conducted during the full cycle phenology project relies on collaborations. I will then describe our approach towards finding partners and developing the network. I will demonstrate the utility of our network for generating results and maps that show how sample collection by multiple partners allows us to understand which factors influence the timing of reproduction and genetic structure of our model species across its breeding range. And I'll conclude with how broad-scale, partner-driven research benefits the DOD. Operational flexibility to support the DOD's training mission is well served by conserving biodiversity and ecosystem integrity on DOD-managed properties, making them resilient to new threats that emerge from non-stationary climate. Integrated natural resource management plans guide the monitoring, management, and research that directly contribute to conservation. For avian species, the DOD Partners in Flight Group provides expertise for the nexus between the DOD mission and avian conservation and management. Their work is particularly important because the Department of Defense installations provide habitat for more than 70 species of migratory birds that are considered species of conservation concern. These species inhabit more than 300 installations across North America. Partners in Flight helps to guide management to preclude the listing of additional species as threatened and endangered. One pressing need for managers is reliable information about whether and how populations may cope or adapt to environmental changes associated with non-stationary climate conditions. One of the most predominant and consequential responses to climate change is for organisms to shift their phenology or the timing of events throughout their annual cycle. Warming temperatures in winter and spring are advancing the timing of seed germination and leaf out, which shifts peak primary productivity to earlier in the spring. As a result, the timing of egg laying in primary consumers like insects has advanced as well. For birds, the timing of life history events like breeding is strongly tied to seasonal patterns of weather, primary productivity, and the annual cycles of the arthropods that form their prey base. Birds breed in the spring and summer when peaks in primary productivity produce abundant resources. As growing seasons and prey peaks advance earlier in the spring, the timing of avian breeding seasons may fall out of synchrony with peaks in prey resources. As shown as in the example on the right of the slide, caterpillar abundance peaked earlier than the brood rearing period for birds, creating a mismatch between caterpillar abundance and the time period when birds need to supply prey to rapidly growing young. Mismatch phenology can have negative consequences on avian productivity and survival, and if strong enough, could lead to declines in population abundance. However, not all birds are experiencing mismatch. There is variability in how birds are responding to climate change, both within and among species. Some populations have responded to warming spring temperatures by arriving earlier to the breeding grounds which allows for earlier breeding to track advancing prey resources, decreasing the likelihood of mismatch. In the review of avian arrival dates, Hurlburt and Lang showed that some populations have advanced the timing of spring arrival by as much as six days, while other populations have had little or no change in arrival to the breeding grounds. 
these populations may be more vulnerable to mismatch. It is unclear, though, why some populations show phenology shifts and others do not. There could be underlying genetic differences between populations or differences in phenotypic plasticity. Studying the differences between populations requires a, a broadly scoped study that spans genetics, phenotypes, behavioral observations, and the collection of data on demographic rates, all in response to climate conditions. Identifying populations that will be vulnerable to climate-driven mismatch requires a full annual cycle approach because events occurring during one period of the annual cycle may influence outcomes during later parts of the annual cycle. This figure from Small and Lorenz and others shows several nice examples of interseasonal or carryover effects for migratory American red starts. Red starts breed in Canada and eastern forests, shown in yellow on this map. They winter in the Caribbean and Central America, shown in purple. Winter weather and habitat conditions can predict both survival through spring migration and reproductive success in the breeding season. Similarly, spring weather and habitat conditions may affect everything from the timing of arrival to reproductive outcomes to the onset of fall migration. Because of these interseasonal effects, we must understand the relationship between weather and timing across the whole annual cycle to identify why some birds may or may not shift the timing of the breeding season in response to climate change. The benefits of understanding ecological responses across the full annual cycle are widely acknowledged in conservation literature. However, logistically, it can be very difficult to study birds in all parts of the year. In addition to sampling birds across the entire year, seasonal movements at continental scales provide special challenges for studying migratory birds. For example, if you wanted to study the annual cycle of a red start breeding at Fort Drum in New York, you would have to work at the installation at likely stopover sites along the eastern flyway during spring and fall and in the Caribbean in winter. This large spatio-temporal scale of data collection combined with the breadth of sampling required to understand mechanisms underlying phenology shifts provided strong incentive for developing a network of partners across North and Central America to address questions about phenology of migratory birds. Our full cycle phenology project aims to address the question, how do genetics and annual cycles of migratory birds affect phenological responses to climate change? We use American kestrels as a model species for year-round data collection and hypothesis testing. Kestrels are an excellent species for building a full cycle partnership uh, network for several reasons. They are easily identifiable because of their large body size and characteristic behavior. They can be recognized by even non-bird watchers, and people find their hunting behavior, frequent vocalization, and distinctive coloration to be charismatic. Kestrels use human-made nest boxes during the breeding season, which allows researchers and citizen scientists to create nest box trails that can be monitored for occupancy and productivity. During migration, kestrels can be counted and captured at multiple hawk migration sites along North America flyways. During the non-breeding seasons, kestrels hunt in open areas where they can, are easy to observe and capture. The relative ease of capturing kestrels during each part of their annual cycle makes them an outstanding study species when seasonal sampling, sampling is required. Not only are kestrels a great subject for a partner network, they are an excellent model system for studying responses to climate change. American kestrels are widespread across North America, and their migratory stat strategies vary with latitude. In more northern latitudes, kestrels are long-distance migrants. In mid-latitudes, kestrels migrate shorter distances, and some populations are partial migrants, with both resident and migratory individuals. Finally, in the southern part of the range, kestrels do not migrate and remain resident year-round. This natural variation allows us to examine how differences in the annual cycles and migration strategies affect breeding phenology. And finally, there's good evidence that kestrels in Western North America are responding to climate change differently than kestrels in Eastern North America. In the West, kestrels have shown changes in migration distance, wintering latitude, and breeding phenology. 
But in the east, kestrels have not shown changes in migration distance, wintering latitude, or breeding phenology. And this difference creates a great comparative study within a species. Our study design requires gathering information on the timing of breeding, productivity, and survival of kestrels across their range, combining biological samples from individual birds, as well as data about environmental conditions. We collect samples and data on vital rates from kestrels that use nest boxes in the summer, and we observe and capture kestrels for sampling at migration sites and during the winter. We use a combination of stable isotope ratios and claws, satellite transmitters, and genetic markers to track the movement of individual birds across the annual cycle. In addition, we're using the DNA extracted from feathers to genotype kestrels across several candidate genes that are associated with circadian rhythms or migration. We used three main approaches to find non-DOD partners to contribute samples to this collaboration. First, Hawkwatch International and the Peregrine Fund's American Kestrel Program, both of those nonprofits are co-PIs on this project. They did targeted outreach to other migration monitoring organizations and citizen scientists who maintain kestrel nest box trails. Second, we contacted other kestrel researchers and agency partners across North America to see if they could participate. And finally, we have broadcast this project needs and contribution opportunities on social media, through presentations at conferences, and on our website. We identified key DOD installations to round out sampling and data collection. We used a stratified approach in selecting installations within the Kestrels range and within one of three flyways, western, central, and eastern. Within each flyway, we identified installations along a latitudinal gradient where we expected to find kestrels with different migration strategies. For example, we expected to find full migrants at, on northern sites, residents in the south, and partial migrants at mid-latitudes. At present, data have been contributed by more than 80 partners from academia, nonprofit institutions, natural resource agencies, and the general public. As you can see, citizen scientists make up the largest contribution by count of individuals. Many of these folks are a part of the Peregrine Fund's American Kestrel Partnership. And we've benefited from their outreach and coordination of kestrel researchers over the past few years. This graph illustrates how our network contributes data across the annual cycle with different lines for non-breeding, spring migration, breeding season, and fall migration contributors. Each colored bar represents the type of partner contributing samples. During the breeding season, we receive data from university teams, DOD sites, and citizen scientists. Nonprofit scientists collect data during the migration season, and then the non-breeding season is mostly covered by university and agency partners. In collaboration with seasonal technicians, we hired with project funds. This map plots the locations of samples from breeding season contributors. The large blue dot highlights the DOD sites, and the pink dots are individual data points from all other contributors. Not shown here are some additional samples that we've been, uh, that have been provided from researchers in Canada. As you can see, we have excellent coverage of kestrel habitat in no most of North America that mul um, from multiple flyways from east to west. And we have the full latitudinal gradient of potential differences in migratory behavior. Here's an example of how those data are being used to inform our understanding of breeding phenology. Using more than 1,500 nest records submitted by our partners, we examined whether temperature, precipitation, or the start of the growing season best predicts egg laying dates of kestrels across North America. We found that the start of the growing season was the best predictor of egg laying. As a result, we found an interesting spatial pattern to nest initiation, shown here in the central map figure. Some of the earliest nesters were along the west coast and low elevation areas east of the Cascades and in the Midwest, shown here in the bluish colors and later nesters showed in orange. 
This results, along with others, are being used to build a model that Jay's going to talk about in the next segment. In addition to providing information about monitoring and behavior, our permitted partners collected feather samples for us across the year. This graphic is similar to the one I showed you a couple of slides ago, uh, that in each color represents a different type of partner. Instead of showing the phases of the annual cycle, you can follow around the circle to see the different months of the year. Each line in this figure represents a sample collected on a given date by partner type. Notably, you'll see that we're able to collect samples throughout the whole year because of our partnership. No one partner covered the whole year. And here's the spatial extent of our genetic sampling during the breeding season with samples collected at DOD and non-DOD sites. Again, this network provided a large-scale effort and, as far as we know, is the most extensive collection of genetic material for kestrels that's ever been done. The genetic samples were used to create a genoscape, or a spatially explicit map, of genetic structure of American kestrels. In partnership with Kristen Riggs' lab, we used RAD sequencing to identify variant SNPs, and found support for five genetically distinct group of kestrels in Alaska, the western part of North America, Texas, the eastern part of North America, and southern Florida. This level of resolution had not been described before for kestrels, and it's interesting to see that there may be some genetic differences underlying change in phenology between western and eastern kestrels. Analysis of the candidate genes are underway, and we should be able to report on those results in the next year or two. One of the key components to maintain our partner network is the work of our project manager, Angeline Hunt. Sampling at this scale requires extensive permitting and reporting and considerable coordination. In addition, communication is important to keep protocols consistent and for timely submission of samples and data, and to keep partners appraised of the interesting results coming from their contributions. Angeline has been a central point of contact with partners DOD managers, field crew, and permitting agencies. In conclusion, I hope I have demonstrated the need for full annual cycle research for addressing, addressing questions about the effects of climate change on wildlife. Though conducting research around the calendar can be very challenging, especially for migratory birds that move large distances over the landscape and are often too small for tracking devices. Our approach to this challenge was to create a large-scale network of partners. We found that a coordinated effort resulted in data and samples across the annual cycle and throughout the range of kestrels in North America. We said the reliable knowledge can be generated to address questions across the annual cycle of kestrels. Some of the benefits to the Department of Defense are uh, that we are addressing research needs at an appropriate scale and scope to inform models for forecasting species response to climate change. Reliable information and tools for making predictions will support the objectives of the DOD Coordinating Bird Monitoring Plan by providing advanced warning of species negatively impacted by climate change. Our next steps are to use the framework of our partnership and modeling effort to demonstrate the portability of this approach for mission-sensitive and watchlist species. It is increasingly recognized that species management requires perspectives across the landscape, not just within the fence line of DOD jurisdiction. This project leverages projects like the American Kestrel Partnership that occurs widely outside of DOD properties to inform species management on DOD lands. Finally, this effort creates a foundation for long-term phenology and population monitoring and collaborations on phenology projects. Before I end, I'd like to thank some of the institutional partners, including co-PIs from ERDIC, Hawkwatch, and the Peregrine Fund, our DOD installation managers, and some of the federal and state agencies, nonprofits, and universities that have greatly contributed to this project. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Julie. And for those on the phone that require additional information, there is a link in the slides that can be downloaded from the webinar webpage um, that will take you to um, Julie's um, project webpage where key documents uh, 
are also uh, available for download. Uh, at this point, we're going to go ahead and start answering some of the questions that are coming in. As a reminder, you may submit questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. Um, uh, Julie, how do you keep your partners uh, fully engaged and involved over the lifespan of this project? Um, we use a couple of different strategies. Um, some of them I mentioned we use one-on-one -on -one communication with our project manager team or with our co-PIs. Um, and then we also send out updates to all of our DOD land managers, for example, during the breeding season when we're working on different properties across North America. And we send, uh, in the, within those updates, we show what's happening on each installation within nest boxes and report, sometimes other species use the nest boxes and not just kestrels, and so we'll report on, on what's inside those cavities. And it's actually pretty exciting. Because it creates this unifying view of the biological communities and phenology across different DOD installations from different parts of North America, from Florida to Alaska. Um, in addition, we provide blog posts uh, about each seasonal activity on our website, and we send those out to our partners as well. And so people can really um, see where each of their kind of contributions go to addressing research questions. Thank you so much, Julie. Can you can you clarify why you are stratifying North America by three regions, West, Central, and East? Yeah. So when we when we started the project, we used uh, previous research that had been done on raptor migration, uh, especially kestrels that tend to show a very um, north-south migration pattern with very little longitudinal drift, and so we thought that three flyways, Western, Central, and Eastern, would encompass the different sort of migration flyways of kestrels. However, after we um, completed our genoscape, we see that genetically there may be some blending between the Central flyway and Eastern flyway. And so we might begin to consider perhaps um, the Rockies as the main divide between the sort of two groups of kestrels in the Western and then a Central Eastern flyway group. Thank you, Julie. Uh, are you aware of any other examples of networks that provide data or samples about migratory birds throughout the year? Uh, yeah, actually, um, there's an international community of researchers that work on swallows. Uh, and that group is led by uh, David Winkler out of, uh, I think, Cornell, and it's called the Gondolinas de las Americas. And uh, like kestrels, swallows use nest boxes, and so they are very amenable to uh, researchers uh, tracking occupancy and monitoring breeding. And so that's, a, that's another group that uses sort of a network approach to look at uh, life history across the annual cycle. Thank you. And back to your partner network, because it is um, really fascinating. How long did it take to establish this network? Um, um, well, you know, honestly, we started the, we've, we've had two full years of running this project, and um, I would say uh, it took us about nine months to get sort of the enough partners to create uh, capacity, but we are always adding people who, as they find out about it, uh, would like to contribute information, and so we're very fortunate because um, one of the powers of this partnership is that people have long-term data over several years. And so if someone joins, say, in 2019, this year, they might have data or even samples from, say, the previous five years that they, they'd be willing to contribute. And so that really creates a powerful perspective, both spatially and then again through time. Thank you. And as you manage your current partners and potentially future partners that you're adding, how do you manage the large amount of data that you are receiving? Yes, that's a great question. Um, well, we're very fortunate that several members of our crew are very apt uh, at uh, collecting data, at creating methods for collecting data and for uh, managing it and for working with it uh, for analyses. And so um, right now, 
many of our partners are actually using, we're using um, an online tool for a collection of data. So data are collected electronically and then put into a form and standardized uh, for electronic data collection. And so that decreases the chance of errors. And then that's all put within a relational database. Thank you so much. And one last question before we turn it over to Jason for the second part of this presentation. Do you think or believe that your approach can be applied to other migratory birds that may be less um, readily visible or amenable to study? I, I do think so. Um, I mean, I, I think we started with, like, as I mentioned in the presentation, sort of a species that's uh, people recognize and uh, know, even if they're not um, a biologist or an ornithologist, they, you know, these are, like I said, re readily recognizable. But, uh, you know, we're seeing everything from eBird to other sorts of technologies being developed all the time so that we are collecting data. You know, the, the recent advances in radar is a good example, too, at sort of a very large scale for several, several types of species. And so I think Jay's going to talk a little bit about sort of the portability of both um, the model and then also the network approach for different types of species. Great. Thank you, Julie, for a really fascinating overview. And we're going to turn it over to Jason, otherwise known as Jay, who's going to deliver the second portion um, of today's webinar. Um, Jay uh, Winiarski is a doctoral student in the Ecology, Evolution, and Behavior program at Boise State University in Idaho. The focus of his research is avian migration ecology in the context of full annual cycles. He is particularly interested in identifying environmental drivers of breeding and migration phenology in migratory birds and also forecasting the consequences of changes in timing using this full annual cycle modeling um, approach or approaches. Uh, Jay earned his bachelor's degree in wildlife biology from the University of Rhode Island and a master's degree in fisheries, wildlife, and conservation biology from North Carolina State University. Uh, Jason, please proceed. Okay, well, thanks, Rula, for the introduction, and thanks to the startup team for their opportunity to present in this webinar series today and for their support of this project. And thanks, everyone, for taking the time to listen. Okay, so uh, I will first talk about some of the challenges of studying and forecasting climate change impacts for migratory species and how full annual cycle simulation models could provide a path forward in the way that uh, we study phenology in a changing climate. Then I'll provide a quick introduction to our work and briefly touch on the objectives for this project. Uh, following that, I will talk a bit about the individual based modeling approach that we're using and present a simple individual based model that identifies mechanisms uh, enabling breeding phenology shifts in our local study system here in Boise, Idaho. Uh, next, I will describe the ongoing work we are doing uh, to scale up this model, which we're calling SCOPE uh, for the rest of North America. And finally, uh, I will leave you with some key points from our work so far. Uh, how we plan to apply this model to other species and systems, and how it might address uh, some of the needs of DOD scientists and managers. So understanding how animals will adapt to climate change uh, requires knowledge of how climate influences their biology year round, and how events in different seasons interact with one another. And one of the many ways in which climate change affects wildlife is through changes in phenology or the timing of seasonal life history events. Uh, for migratory birds in particular, many ecological relationships are uh, tightly synchronized to take advantage of seasonal resources, and uh, any alterations in climate can cause these relationships to become out of sync with one another. Um, migratory birds also have to incorporate migration, breeding, and molt within their annual cycle, um, so it's likely that the timing of these events during one season can 
affect timing and performance in another season. And uh, these are known as carryover effects. Um, so one nice example of this phenomenon was presented in a paper by Rockwell et al. on winter carryover effects on breeding in the Kirtland's warbler. The Kirtland's warbler is a neotropical migrant that breeds in jackpine forests in northern Wisconsin and Michigan and winters in the Caribbean. Um, and they, uh, these authors found that during drier winters in the Bahamas, the timing of arrival for second year and after second year males on the breeding grounds was delayed and later nest initiation dates uh, as a result were significantly associated with, with fewer uh, offsprings pledged, which you can see in the two plots to the right here. So understanding how species are affected by climate across their full annual cycle, uh, how climate affects timing of different events, and how timing of one event can influence the timing of another event is, is really key to forecasting climate change impacts. Um, so studying animals outside of the breeding season has uh, really gained traction over the past couple of decades, and much more attention now is being paid to seasonal carryover effects, uh, both in the way that they influence the timing of subsequent events, but also uh, the demographic consequences that uh, environmental conditions and timing have on, on different events during the annual cycle. So this annual cycle approach is, is pretty appealing for uh, forecasting responses to climate change, but there, <clears throat> the challenges still remain for studying and predicting phenology shifts and carryover effects. Uh, many of the data sources that are available for understanding climate responses only come from a single season or point in time during the annual cycle. We're also at a point where it's uh, logistically difficult or expensive to track individuals throughout their annual cycle, or um, they're just too small to be tracked through uh, breeding, migration, and wintering. And species can cover really vast geographic areas over the course of a, of a year, so they're not necessarily restricted to DOD installations uh, let alone a single country. And um, it's often not feasible to uh, experimentally manipulate something like climate in a field setting for, for most species. Um, also integrating individual variation is a, is a key challenge for this full annual cycle modeling approach. Uh, the genetic composition of an individual might relate to its phenotypic plasticity, and that's whether or not an individual is able to uh, modify a trait like the timing of egg laying in response to uh, changing environmental conditions. Uh, so incorporating genetic variation at both the individual and population level uh, is also really important. Uh, to date, the most common approaches used to evaluate ecological impacts of climate change are tools like uh, species distribution models, uh, where occurrence data is correlated with environmental data or uh, Leslie matrix or stage structured models. And most of these approaches uh, aren't able to include um, important biological mechanisms such as uh, dispersal, evolution, and uh, individual variation. So we need tools that um, are going to help us identify mechanisms that enable phenology shifts and also incorporate carryover effects um, in order to provide accurate climate change forecasts. So our way of overcoming these challenges to full annual cycle modeling uh, with this project is to use individual-based modeling. And individual-based models, um, sometimes referred to as agent-based models, are a way of uh, modeling populations uh, such that all individuals are considered explicitly so in an individual base model or IBM, um, simulated individuals interact with one another and with a virtual environment. And they're, they follow basic ecological rules to maximize their fitness. And as a result of uh, these behaviors um, and individual level interactions, uh, population level behaviors start to emerge. Um, so IBMs are a nice way to uh, model the complexity that we see in the real world, and they even allow us to create uh, manipulative experiments in a way that wouldn't be 
uh, possible otherwise. <clears throat> IBMs provide a, a very flexible modeling framework and they're uh, increasingly being used in different kinds of scenario planning to understand and predict the impacts of energy infrastructure, uh, land use change, recreation disturbance, and climate. So our goal with this uh, sort of project is to create a full annual cycle IBM for the American Kestrel and to use it to test mechanisms that best explain the patterns that we're seeing in Kestrel breeding phenology shifts. And then once we have a better understanding of the mechanisms that enable or constrain breeding phenology shifts, uh, we can then use the model to create more accurate projections for Kestrel populations under different climate scenarios. Um, and then with some slight modifications, we hope to apply the model to species of conservation concern uh, that could hinder the DOD's military training and, and preparedness. So I think it'd be helpful to provide a, a tangible example of the IBM approach. Um, like I mentioned, our model species for the IBM is the American Kestrel, uh, which is a small general falcon that breeds across North America. They're a nice uh, species for us to study because they readily used artificial nest boxes that we put up for them. Uh, so we're able to easily monitor breeding kestrels in nest boxes, uh, mark individual birds. And as a result, we have a nice long-term data set on timing of breeding, uh, nest success, and survival for, for banded individuals in this population. Uh, kestrels in this region are also partially migratory. Uh, meaning that breeding individuals may remain at our study site year-round uh, while others migrate south for the winter. Uh, so basically we have a, a mix of resident and migrant individuals. And what's uh, really unique about our local study system in terms of studying breeding phenology shifts is that uh, winters, but not spring, springs have warmed uh, significantly since the the late 1980s, as you can see in the two plots on the right. And over the course of that time, we've seen the timing of egg laying and kestrels advance by uh, approximately two weeks, which you can see in the plot on the left. So in most systems where breeding phenology shifts are studied, uh, increasing spring temperatures are advancing plant and insect phenology. And the leading hypothesis is that breeding is occurring earlier because there's uh, selective pressure for specialist songbirds to nest earlier in order to, to track um, peak abundance of prey, such as uh, caterpillars. Okay, so that's an interesting contrast to other systems, but how might uh, warming winters influence the timing of breeding? Um, there's evidence that kestrels in Western North America are migrating shorter distances or not at all when winters are warmer. And if a kestrel remains on or near the breeding ground, uh, they may have the ability to nest earlier in the season. And using stable isotopes and resighting data, uh, we see that resident kestrels are breeding earlier and more frequently with, um, with each other than with migrant kestrels. And these earlier breeding individuals uh, tend to be more successful and more likely to survive and return in subsequent, subsequent seasons. Um, so what we can do to uh, test our hypotheses is to simulate individual kestrels in their annual cycle, which is uh, represented in this diagram, uh, in an individual-based model, uh, run different experiments where we can turn uh, different effects on and off, and those are uh, highlighted in the colored circles, and see what combination of potential mechanisms uh, produces shifts in laying data that best match our empirical data. Um, so basically the model, the model follows the cycle outlined in this diagram. Um, we determine when male and female kestrels are available to breed based on things like winter temperature and uh, distance of uh, an individual migrate. Uh, they go on to pair. They have a certain number of offspring uh, if they're su successful at nesting. Um, and then they decide to migrate and uh, how far based on winter temperature and uh, a few other variables. And then the cycle keeps repeating itself 
every year in the IBM. Um, so here's uh, not quite a full view of the IBM interface that we built in a program called NetLogo. Uh, NetLogo is an open source platform for building IBM, and it's a pretty popular option. It's, it's used widely to train students and teachers and, and researchers in individual-based modeling. So this is what the model looks like in NetLogo uh, after a single simulation is run. So you can see we have our virtual environment with the non-breeding grounds in blue and the breeding grounds in red. And there are two switches at the top left to turn <clears throat> winter warming and a seasonal fitness decline on or off, uh, which is used to run uh, experiments with different combinations of mechanisms. So in this example, uh, we allow winters to become warmer and there's a seasonal decline in fitness. Uh, so in this case, um, birds tend to breed earlier uh, and then um, and these earlier breeders are, are more successful um, because they initiate nesting earlier in the season. Uh, but we can keep track of uh, <clears throat> the time steps by year and date in the windows below the switches. And <clears throat> finally, um, although only one plot is visible here, we have several output plots recording dates of when individuals are available to breed, how far they migrate, uh, how many young they produce on average, rates of immigration and survival. And all these outputs allow us to ensure that the model is, is running properly and matching patterns that we see in our local study system. So for example, um, it's not shown here, but we can track um, sort of mating. And that's, um, so basically we're, we're looking at the frequency of residents pairing and breeding with other residents. Uh, residents pairing and breeding with migrants or vice versa to verify that the model is uh, behaving realistically and f reflecting what we see in our in our wild kestrel population. And then once we run the model, we can use uh, pattern matching to validate different sets of hypotheses and mechanisms. Uh, so in the violin plot to the left, we show the the distribution of slope estimates for uh, shift in timing of breeding. Uh, and that's in days per year for each experiment. And then, uh, so we run each of these experiments hundreds of times in that logo. And after we complete the simulations, we found that um, winter warming is driving shorter migration distances or leading to a fully resonant strategy. Uh, assortative mating emerges um, as residents, which are available to breed earlier in the season are more likely to pair with other residents, while migrants tend to pair with other migrants. And these earlier resident nesters are more successful. And so together, uh, these mechanisms are having uh, additive effects on nest initiation dates. Um, and these mechanisms are part of the full model, which you can see all the way to the right in the violin plot. So the slope estimates uh, derived from that model uh, most closely aligned with the, the shift in timing of breeding that we see uh, in the plot on the right here for, for our wild kestrel population. Okay, so uh, now that we've shown uh, how this model can be used to understand kestrel breeding phenology shifts in Idaho, we are uh, in the process <coughs> of scaling up the model. And to do that, we're using data from DOD sites across the country, which are uh, shown by these red points on the map here, uh, plus data from citizen scientists and researchers all over North America and during all parts of the Kestrel's annual cycle, which um, was shown in Julie's presentation. And we're calling this model SCOPE. Um, and that stands for simulation of carryover effects on phenology. Um, so essentially we're taking our local model and we're making it uh, more spatially explicit for North America um, by using global climate model data and environmental layers uh, that represent start of spring date. And uh, we include that because it allows us to understand uh, the potential for phenological mismatch for, for Kestrel. Um, so, so far we've uh, gathered and analyzed data on 
reproductive success, survival, um, probability of, of migration, uh, how far um, birds are migrating, and then uh, spring arrival date. And we're <clears throat> using data sets from, again, from citizen scientists in our own field efforts and from published studies, um, uh, data from the bird banding lab and uh, eBird, like Julie had mentioned. And we're examining these data sets in relation to climate and start of spring. And uh, this information is, is being used now to uh, parameterize different uh, life cycle events within scope. For the American Kestrel, uh, we're focusing on running simulations in scope for uh, populations in three flyways. And uh, Julie mentioned this, but that's because we know that climate is changing at different pace in these regions. The wintering distributions of kestrels are uh, shifting north at a greater rate in the western flyway, for example, than uh, the other two flyways. And this may correspond with breeding phenology shifts that we tend to see in the west. Uh, compared with uh, little or no change in the timing of breeding in, in the east. Um, so here's another view of the NetLogo interface. And uh, again, this is cut off a little bit for, for the scope model, but like our local study system model, we're able to, again, test different mechanisms that underlie phenology shifts with the, uh, by using the sliders. And we're able to, uh, again, view out, out view plots or output plots for pattern matching and model validation. <clears throat> so uh, using our Idaho Kestrel study, study system, I've shown the utility of individual based models as a framework for uh, testing potential mechanisms uh, that are underlying breeding phenology shifts. And uh, once we've nailed down what those mechanisms are, we can begin to produce more reliable forecasts of climate impacts and hopefully have a better sense of uh, which species and populations are able to shift their timing and keep pace with a, with a changing climate. And this kind of information will be, I think, particularly valuable for DOD biologists and managers um, so uh, they're able to identify which species may lack the adaptive capacity to shift their timing in response to climate change and hopefully better allocate resources for uh, management. And right now we have a postdoc, Bree Powers. Um, she just started. She'll be applying the scope model to some DOD mission sensitive and watch list species. And we're in the process of uh, narrowing down that list and uh, figuring out which, which species we're gonna apply scope to. Uh, but we hope that we can essentially take this model and use a, a, a pretty similar uh, data mining approach um, and maybe some of the same resources that we're using for kestrels and, um, and just take this whole approach and use it for some other species. Um, I'm sure we'll probably need to use some other data sets uh, depending on what kind of data is available for, for some of these species. But I think it should be flexible enough where we can, we can uh, try and apply it to, to most anything out there, as long as there's good information on uh, phenology and climate. <clears throat> so finally, I'd just like to acknowledge all the collaborators on this project. Um, Ben Pauly, who led the initial development of the IBM that we're building off of today, and who's uh, advising our ongoing work with Scope. Our project manager, who keeps uh, our research running across North America, and graduate students here at Boise State that are um, contributing really important pieces uh, to the Scope model. Uh, also, our co-PIs for their help with gathering genetic samples and uh, other data that we're using for the model. And uh, last but not least, um, I want to thank the DOD biologists and managers that have been uh, just really generous with their time and have been pretty critical to our data collection efforts in the field. Great, thank wanted... you. Oh, go ahead. 
I just wanted to mention that our uh, that an updated version of the the model should be ready uh, later in the year. So anyone can uh, check back with us later and, and if they'd like more information. And yeah, thanks for your time. Thank you, Jason. Is the model are you going to provide that uh, free of charge to anyone that asks? Um. I think yeah, anyone that's working with the DoD should be able to yeah access that and and use that. Wonderful. Yep. All right. Great. Well, we have a number of questions uh, that have come in for you. Um, we're going to start off with the first one. What are the minimum pieces of information needed to parameterize a full annual cycle model like the one that you described? Yeah, so I think <clears throat> some idea of of how phenology during different parts of the the annual cycle is affected by climate, um, how climate might uh, impact different vital rates, reproductive success, and survival, um, and then yeah, how timing of different events uh, can carry over and and influence the timing of subsequent events. Um, so for this model, we have uh, information regarding uh, how winter severity impacts survival, um, whether or not birds are migrating and how far, um, how winter severity affects timing in the spring, uh, how timing of breeding uh, in relation to start of spring date affects reproductive success. Um, so I think, you know, it'll probably be different uh, depending on the, the species we want to look at, um, but we might be able to use uh, some, some similar data sets that we're using now for the, for the American kestrel. Um, so yeah, yeah, um, as long as there's some information out there about uh, phenology and climate uh, and demographic rates um, for a particular species, that, that should be enough. And then if some pieces maybe aren't available, we might be able to, to mine some other information from, you know, related species. Thank you so much. Um, what are you sourcing the global climate model and environmental layers from that are being fed into the model? Yeah, so we're using <clears throat> climate models uh, provided by the NA Cortex group. So they're another uh, sort of funded project. Um, so we're using data, uh, some of their data to create different temperature and precipitation layers that that can be fed into our IBM. And then we're using the same NA Cortex data set and um, we're using that to forecast changes in the start of spring. So, so we're using a, a phenology model and uh, temperature data from NA Cortex to, to forecast start of spring date for different parts of North America. And, and yeah, the NA Cortex group has been helping us quite a bit, um, taking some of their data sets and uh, bias correcting them to uh, the DayMet data that we're using to uh, parameterize relationships between phenology or demographic rates and, and climate. Great, thank you so much. Um, another question, how do you plan or um, to incorporate genetic variation in the IBM? Yeah, so, Right now, we're kind of working on getting a handle of the candidate genes that might affect annual timing for kestrels and uh, how they're related to different climate variables. So yeah, in the IBM, I think the idea is that we can maybe assign a genotype for each individual and that genotype will, will influence uh, maybe something like migration distance or timing. Um, and then we can also uh, maybe quantify genetic diversity for different populations and see if that has an effect on the, the potential for orchestral to shift their timing. Um, but Julie, yeah, Julie might have more to say about that because she's been working more with the genetic data. Julie, would you like to add something to Jay's response? 
Uh, no, I think Jay actually covered it really well. It's, uh, the concept would just be, I mean, the, the beautiful part about individual based models is that you get to create a virtual kestrel and so we can assign those kestrels genotypes and have those be heritable and track, um, you know, genetics over time. And so that's, that's pretty exciting. Great. And, and maybe another question for both of you, since we've pulled you into the discussion, Julie. Um, let's start with you. In your communications with DOD managers, what do you feel are their main concerns or areas of interest with respect to migratory birds? So, Julie? Um, well, so it seems that, you know, um, in general, most most sort of DOD managers are looking at the migratory birds on the installations that they're managing, and they're wondering, you know, what, you know, how will threats change, um, you know, given that climate change is happening. And so we're specifically trying to, you know, help give them tools to identify uh, migratory birds that um, would be vulnerable to sort of phenology mismatch. And so. Um, you know, in addition to that, there's other questions about, um, for example, maybe changes in fire frequency and changes in habitat. And so there's sort of a, a broad, um, you know, there's there's lots of things to address with climate change, um, both the sort of biotic uh, effects of it and then also sort of these abiotic processes that can, address, that can drive population changes. And so, um, you know, for us, we, we are, they understand we're working with phenology and, and those are the, the main um, questions that we're addressing. Great, thank you. Jay, is there um, anything you'd like to add to that? Um, no, I don't think so. All right, well, another question for the two of you and this time we'll start with you, Jay. Um, how will you go about distributing scope and making it user friendly for DOD managers? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and probably something we'll have a better handle of once the, the model kind of nears completion here later this year. Um, yeah, I mean, so they can, so NetLog is a free program that anyone can download. Um, and then we can openly share uh, any of the models that we're working on, but yeah, I think to make it kind of easy and user friendly for DOD folks, you know, maybe it would be a good idea to have a workshop or something similar where we can kind of go through step by step and maybe work through um, a couple of different species, just as an example to show uh, maybe how we're uh, collecting and parameterizing different parts of the model. Um, and then potentially um, different scenarios that we can that we can run for for different species. Um, and yeah, maybe Julie has something to add to that too. Yeah, one of really? the reasons. Um, yeah, sure. One of the reasons that we chose NetLogo is that it does have a very um, friendly user interface. You know, with uh, so that uh, people can run their own hypotheses by changing different components by using sliders and buttons instead of having to go into the code and recoding it. And so, um, you know, we hope to create a user manual that will go with scope and so people can can get in that logo and, and add scope and then, then run their own scenarios. All right, great, thank you. Another question for both of you. Um, what are the next steps uh, and maybe you can start, Julie. What are the next steps for the partner uh, network? Well, yeah, so the ne the next steps, um, you know, in, in moving this whole project forward since we're, we're all working together with the modeling and the network um, is we have these two years of empirical data that we're combining with uh, legacy data to prioritize the model. And then over the course of the next year, we'll be uh, verifying the model and validating it against what we see this year. And so, um, you know, we've just started the migration season, which is actually where our our tracking of the annual cycle starts. And so hawk migration sites are counting and capturing kestrels as we speak. And uh, we'll start to predict like counts at different sites and, and passage timing. Um, and so with the scope model, and so we're using this year to verify the model. 
Great, thank you. And as we wrap up here now, um, what last messages would you leave? Uh, would you like to leave our audience with today, uh, Julie? Uh, I think that uh, the maybe the take-home message is that uh, you know, as we are experiencing sort of large-scale drivers of environmental change. Um, we are going to have to address questions about species management, land management um, at the scale that this environmental change is occurring. And that can be done with sort of these broad views, partnerships um, in working together to address questions as long as there's some a coordinated effort to collect those data and then put them into a meaningful framework to address research questions. Great. And before we wrap up, Jay, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I just would want to emphasize um, this individual-based modeling approach um, and sort of our, our, our framework for data mining and using citizen scientist data sets or um, these broader scale partnerships to, to really start thinking about the full annual cycle of, of migratory birds so we can, we can better manage them. Great. Well, I'd like to thank you both for a great webinar. Um, as we wrap up here, I'd like to remind you all that uh, our next webinar will be on Thursday, October 17, and it will focus on DOD-funded research on managing AFFF impacts to subsurface environments and assessing commercially available fluorine zones. Registration is open for this and other webinars, so please visit the CERDAP and ESCC webinar webpage to register. Uh, before we conclude, I would like to remind you that both the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on our webinar webpage in case you would like to refer to them in the future. We would appreciate it at this time if you could please take a moment of your busy day to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen. This concludes today's webcast. Thank you so much for your time.